Blue Origin launched a new Shepard suborbital vehicle on August 25 on a mission carrying research and educational payloads. It was the first flight for Blue Origin since July 20, when company founder Jeff Bezos and three other people launched on the first ever crewed New Shepard mission. The mission, dubbed NS-17, was delayed by nearly an hour because of two holds during the countdown, first for an unspecified vehicle issue and then a nearly half-hour hold for what the company called a payload readiness issue. The mission marked the eighth flight for RSS HG Wells, the new Shepard vehicle dedicated to uncrewed missions. The spacecraft reached an altitude of about 106 km during the flight, well above 100 km Kármán line widely recognized as a boundary of space. The mission carried 18 research payloads inside the capsule, 11 of which are supported by NASA. An additional NASA experiment mounted on the vehicle's exterior collected data during the powered landing of the booster to test a sensor and computer system designed for future lunar landers. The NS-17 mission lasted 10 minutes and 15 seconds from launch to capsule landing. The vehicle's booster made a powered landing on a nearby pad a few minutes earlier. Company officials said during the launch webcast, that the next crewed flight of New Shepard will take place soon but didn't offer a more specific schedule. An Ariane Space Soyuz rocket launched 34 OneWeb satellites from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on August 22. The launch was originally targeted for August 19, but that attempt was aborted late in the countdown clock due to a non-nominal event during the final automatic sequence. All 34 spacecraft, which together weigh 5,500 kilograms, separated as planned from the Soyuz by 3 hours and 45 minutes after launch. The satellites deployed into a near-polar orbit 450 kilometers above Earth will migrate over the coming weeks to their operational orbit of altitude 1,200 kilometers. The latest launch brings the company's total in-orbit constellation to 288 satellites. Ariane Space plans to perform 10 more Soyuz launches for OneWeb through 2021 and 2022, enlarging its network to 648 satellites to deliver high-speed, low-latency global internet connectivity. If all goes according to plan, OneWeb will begin providing internet service by the end of 2021 to some of Earth's northern regions. NASA and its partners working on the James Webb Space Telescope have completed their final tests of the giant observatory and are now preparing it for a trip to a South American spaceport for a launch later this year. Conceived more than 30 years ago as a successor of the then-new Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb will be the largest observatory ever to be put in orbit. It is designed to use its infrared eyes to peer further into the universe's history than ever before. With its 6.5-meter in diameter gold-plated mirror, the telescope will attempt to answer questions about the formation of the first stars and galaxies out of the darkness of the early universe. In a press release published on August 26, NASA shared the news that engineering teams have completed Webb's long-spanning comprehensive testing regimen at Northrop Grumman's facilities. The tests made sure that nothing would go wrong with the spacecraft during launch and once in space. Now that observatory testing has concluded, shipment operations have begun. This includes all the necessary steps to prepare Webb for a safe journey through the Panama Canal to its launch location in French Guiana on the northeastern coast of South America. Once Webb arrives in French Guiana, launch processing teams will configure the observatory for flight. The Space Telescope will be launched atop an Ariane 5 rocket in November or early December of this year. SpaceX's budding satellite internet service, Starlink, has shipped 100,000 terminals to customers, SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk said in a series of tweets last week. The terminals, which connect to the Starlink satellites, are part of the $499 kit users receive after signing up for the service. SpaceX has launched more than 1,700 satellites to date, and in addition to the 100,000 shipped terminals, the company has received over half a million additional orders for the service. Starlink now serves users in 14 countries, and according to Musk, license applications are pending in many more countries. The company ultimately wants to launch around 30,000 Starlink satellites into orbit and expand its user pool to millions of customers. Meanwhile, in an application for the next-generation Starlink system submitted to the Federal Communication Commission on August 18, SpaceX proposed two separate configurations for future Starlink constellation, but mentioned that it plans to use only one. The second is a backup in case the FCC rejects the first, SpaceX wrote in the amendment. The company provided two configurations because the first one relies on the Starship craft to deliver the Starlink satellites and the second configuration taps existing Falcon 9 reusable rockets. On August 25, Amazon's satellite internet subsidiary, Project Kuiper, said in its protest letter to FCC that SpaceX broke the rules by submitting two configurations. 
Amazon wrote that SpaceX didn't specify that it would submit two configurations in its original plans, and its approach forces the FCC and other parties to do twice as much technical work. As a result, Amazon is calling on the FCC to dismiss the plan in its current form. According to Amazon the Commission should enforce its rules, dismiss SpaceX's amendment, and invite SpaceX to resubmit its amendment after settling on a single configuration for its Gen 2 system. The recent complaint from Amazon doesn't seem to be a formal lawsuit, but rather a letter of protest. And technically, it's not that Amazon doesn't want SpaceX to launch more Starlink satellites at all, but that it thinks the company should be clearer in its plans to do so. The letter comes shortly after former Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos slammed NASA for giving SpaceX a lunar landing contract over his own space flight company, Blue Origin. Replying to a story about the complaint, Musk tweeted that, it turns out Bezos retired from Amazon to pursue a full-time job filing lawsuits against SpaceX. Meanwhile, Amazon has been working Project Kuiper for the past two years, which plans to launch more than 3,000 internet satellites into low Earth orbit. While Amazon in December passed a critical early hardware milestone for the antennas it needs to connect to the network, it has yet to begin producing or launching its satellites. The ambitious startup Firefly Aerospace expects to launch its first rocket, Alpha, from Vandenberg Space Force Base this week. Firefly announced that it had set a September 2 date for the first launch of its Alpha rocket, and the announcement came a day after the small launch vehicle performed a successful 15-second static fire test on the pad at Vandenberg. Firefly Alpha is designed to boost up to 1 ton of payload to low Earth orbit and 630 kilos to a 500-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit for $15 million. Alpha's first stage is powered by four Reaver 1 engines, capable of delivering a combined thrust of 736 kilonewtons. The second stage is powered by one Lightning 1 engine, delivering 70 kilonewtons of thrust. Both the stages use RP-1 as fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. The inaugural Alpha launch will carry a payload called the Dedicated Research and Education Accelerator Mission, a Firefly initiative to provide a free launch for academic and other private payloads. The launch will also test components of an orbital transfer vehicle the company is developing, called the Space Utility Vehicle. If the first launch is a success a second Alpha would be ready for launch as soon as December, carrying a commercial payload. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. At Starbase, SpaceX is working around the clock to prepare for the first orbital Starship flight test. Starship 20, the orbital-class Starship prototype, is currently sitting on the suborbital launch pad B, and last week, workers detached the ship from the crane that was holding it in place. It appears that the final plumbing and wiring works on the ship ahead of the ground tests are now complete, and workers were spotted inspecting the heat shield tiles and marking them with colored tape to isolate the tiles with cracks or other less visible issues. New heat tiles were also installed on the ship last week. Since its August 11th build site return, Super Heavy Booster 4 is resting inside the high bay, where teams are still working to finish its secondary plumbing and avionics. A few days after its return to the high bay, SpaceX employees removed the 29 Raptor engines of the booster for inspection. Now, just 11 days after workers briskly removed its Raptors, SpaceX has begun the process of reinstalling those engines, potentially paving the way for several crucial milestones. Indeed, as expected, several new Raptors that weren't installed the first time around have joined around two dozen engines that were installed earlier this month. These recently installed 29 engines will support the first static fire test campaign of a flight-worthy Super Heavy booster. Besides the launch vehicles, teams are working to complete works on the ground support equipment tanks that are necessary for an orbital flight. In last week's update, we have mentioned a newly built ground support equipment test tank that was spotted at the build site. This stainless steel GSE propellant tank prototype was transported to the launch site on August 23. Remote camera by LabPadre captured footage of the transportation of this subscale prototype tank, designed to quickly verify basic production quality and design goals. After arriving at the launch site, on August 25, teams conducted a proof test of the GSE tank prototype. SpaceX took advantage of a test window initially believed to be for Starship 20 and put the tank through its paces for the first time. They filled the dome structure with subchilled liquid nitrogen to subject it to high pressure, and the tank developed frost and started to vent. The test appears to be completed without any major issues, and the test results will allow SpaceX to better characterize the thermal properties of the actual GSE tanks. Unlike the test tank, the operational GSE tanks that store cryogenic propellants will be enclosed inside cryo shells designed to insulate their contents. But the insulative properties of the inner tanks, 
will still determine how well that insulation works and how much is needed to reach the desired boil-off rates. The test tank has been disconnected from the tank farm on Friday, indicating that the tests are complete. An intermittent road closure is scheduled for August 31st, possibly to take the tank back to the build site. Also, at the time of making this video, no more road closures are scheduled for this week, so it's not sure if the Ship 20's cryoproof test will take place this week. Speaking about road closures, we have a piece of interesting news coming from SpaceX. As SpaceX has increased its Starship testing and launch activities in South Texas, the company has sought to close the Boca Chica Highway more often. The roadway is mostly used by residents of South Texas to travel from local neighborhoods to Boca Chica Beach. When the road is closed, no one can access or remain on the beach. This situation has turned into a logistical nightmare for SpaceX, which needs road closures to transfer rocket components and perform tests and launches. It appears that Elon Musk now has a possible answer to this problem. Musk's The Boring Company met with Cameron County authorities in July to discuss digging a tunnel from the south end of South Padre Island to the north end of Boca Chica Beach to provide alternate access to the barrier island. Except for launch attempts and high-pressure testing, such a tunnel could provide public access to the beach at all times. Although the distance between South Padre Island and the northern tip of Boca Chica Beach is less than 800 meters, the path runs beneath a shipping channel, necessitating a tunnel dug quite deep into the ground. The proposal is just a concept for now, and an in-depth study would be needed to determine whether a tunnel is even feasible or not. Recent reports state that liquid oxygen is in short supply as demand rises with COVID-19 cases in the United States, and SpaceX worries the shortage could also jeopardize upcoming launches. SpaceX President Gwynne Shotwell pointed out during the 36th Annual Space Symposium on August 24 that this shortage could impact upcoming launches, as many launch providers rely on liquid oxygen. Merlin engines of the Falcon 9 rocket and SpaceX's next-generation Raptor engine which will power the Starship system, both employ supercooled liquid oxygen as an oxidizer for propulsion. If the shortage continues, it could possibly delay launches of both Starship and Falcon series rockets. According to Musk, the oxygen shortage is a risk, but not yet a limiting factor for future launches. Moreover, SpaceX has installed an air separation unit at Starbase which can separate atmospheric air into its primary components. Once the unit is fully operational, SpaceX will be able to use this unit to extract oxygen and nitrogen required for Starship operations from the atmosphere. Moving on to other Starship updates, on August 26, the quick disconnect mechanism for the Super Heavy booster was installed on the orbital launch mount. The quick disconnect arm is used to connect power and fuel lines to the booster before launch. A hydraulic actuator for the QD arm was installed on the launch mount on August 27. Meanwhile, the QD arm for the ship is designed to be installed on the orbital launch tower. The QD arm was lifted and installed onto the fifth segment of the tower on August 29. The arm will be capable of swinging towards the ship to connect the fuel lines and will then quickly swing away from the ship during liftoff. Along with the quick disconnect arm, the tower will also consist of a booster catching arm that will catch the super heavy booster in mid-air. Works on a truss structure and booster catching arm are in progress, and we can expect them to be complete in a few days. On Saturday afternoon, Elon Musk and the Inspiration4 crew flew over the Starbase facility in L-39 and Alpha jets. It is likely that SpaceX provided the Inspiration4 crew with an exclusive tour of the Starbase factory and Starship launch pad. Inspiration4 is the world's first all-civilian mission to orbit aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. The flight will be sponsored by Jared Isaacman, founder and CEO of Shift4 Payments, who will be on the flight along with Haley Arsenault, Christopher Sombrowski, and Sian Proctor. Meanwhile, last week, SpaceX celebrated the second anniversary of the 150 meters hop test of Starhopper, the first Starship prototype to ever take flight at Starbase facility. The flight took place on 27 August 2019, and two years later, SpaceX is now inching toward the first orbital flight of a fully stacked Starship launch system. Undoubtedly a fantastic two years for SpaceX and Starship. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.